Remember, you will die. Death can be a difficult reality for us to face, but in light of our Catholic faith, we have a tremendous reason for hope. So today we meet with Father Justin Braun, and we really talk about what is a happy death? What can we do if we are able to accompany someone in their final hours? Uh, on a personal level, what can we do to prepare ourselves to have a happy death? So even though it's a difficult topic, I do believe that this episode will enlighten us and remind us of the hope and what we live for. We hope that you enjoy. Welcome to Life Beyond the Chariot, a faith and family series from the St. Philip Institute. We believe we are called to not only know, but also to live the truth of the gospel within our homes, in our workplaces, and beyond. We believe we are invited to encounter Christ in the messiness of day-to-day -day life and to live as his disciples. Welcome back, everyone. We have a very special episode today, a very special guest, a friend of the podcast, a friend of the St. Philip Institute, and a rock star in the Diocese of Tyler, <laughs> Father Justin Brunn. How are you, Father? Stupendous. <laughs> Good. Can you tell everyone uh, all the hats you wear in the diocese? I'd be happy to. Uh, currently, I'm the pastor of Sacred Heart Parish in Texarkana, Texas. I'm the director of vocations for the Diocese of Tyler. I am the chaplain uh, for the St. Philip Institute, and I'm a member of our Presbyteral Council. And uh, whatever else I, the bishop generally asked me to do, I'm going to say yes. Uh, so, but those are the main things. Very good. Very good. And we've had Father Braun on the podcast, I think, at least a couple of times oh, yeah. so far. So we're really excited to have you, Father. And today's topic is one that everyone enjoys, death. How to, but a happy death. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. Mickey, can you break that open for us a little more? Well, I, this was an idea I had, um, I guess it started years Years ago, uh, when my dad had passed away, um, I didn't really know. I mean, I prayed my rosary and a chaplain of divine mercy. And, um, and then from that experience, just knowing the depth of and the sacredness of a person's final days, mm. I'm still unpacking it. Mm. So I don't know if I can add much clarity, but I was going through one of my prayer books, and it, ta it was talking about um, like preparation for death. And I was like, this is something that I had never really heard about. Um, it could have been because I wasn't listening, but I hadn't really heard spoken about. Um, and I just thought it'd be great to kind of cover yeah. cover this. Like, how, how does a Catholic prepare for death? Like, mm. what can we start doing? And not that we want to be morbid or anything, but um, what is that like um, in prayers of, like, uh, the Hail Mary, we ask Mary to pray for us at the moment of our death. Right. Um, St. Joseph, we uh, pray for a happy death. Mm -hmm. And so just unpacking that, what does that mean? Mean, yeah. And how can we start preparing now um, for ourselves and even for family members? Because when you're in those most, um, those, those moments of most suffering and confusion or uncertainty, mm -hmm. uh, like what is a path that we can lay in place now that can help us in, in that time? Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. I I gave a talk to my parish, I think last Tuesday night for an hour and twenty minutes about death. So, uh, and, so you're ready to go. Well, I've been thinking about this a lot. Uh, also drove twenty hours in the last two days, so I've been on the road a lot. And uh, there's two things about the happy death phrase that I, I think is good to give context. First is that the happiest death that any human being experienced on this earth was Saint Joseph. Mm -hmm. Because he died with the Blessed Virgin Mary and his son, Jesus Christ. And that's what we all want, right? We all want to die in the arms of Our Lady with the care of her son, the Divine Physician. Um, so, in a sense, we, we want to live such a life that we can die like Joseph did. We can die with the comfort of knowing we're in the, mm -hmm. the hands of God and the comfort of Our Lady. Mm -hmm. um, so, in a, in a sense, it's a call to... Yeah, persevere to the end and live such a life that you can die with joy. Um, but it's also a phrase that when we encourage people to, you know, have a happy death, so to speak. I pray that you will have a happy death that won't be filled with 
suffering and anxiety or, uh, you know, a suddenness and a, and a tragedy uh, that we can be spared the sorrows of a tragic death. We can mm. be spared the sorrows of a long suffering illness uh, that results in our death. And we don't have a lot of control over those things, right? Um, let's be honest, but we have the ability to ask God for that that consolation and that grace. So encouragement for a happy death can can be done by being prayerful about it, first and foremost, obviously, is to, to pray, Lord, help me to be spared those pains. Help me uh, and all of my family members to and all those I love to not suffer in, uh, a tragic death. Um and to not suffer a long illness. But in preparation for this podcast in my class last week, I was thinking about, like, there's a lot of practical things that we just don't really know, right? We just don't. And it's not because I'm sure a lot of priests have talked about it, and we just kind of goes in one ear out the other, mm-hmm. or you, you're chasing your son across the entire church, so mm-hmm. it's kind of hard to pay <laughs> attention. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that last tidbit, what did he say? Uh, so... So I thought about what were the things that I would have loved to have been able to tell, you know, my are done with my grandmother, for instance. She 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 died a good death. She didn't die a tragic death or anything, but I wasn't there to be with her. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was able to do her funeral. This was over 10 years, almost 10 years ago now. Um, and the first thing is just that, and it's, I, I know it's in a lot of prayer books, but is to pray the litany of the saints. Mm. Um, because it's a reminder. It's something the whole family can do in those moments before death or maybe before you're removing a family member's, um, you know, non-necessary life-saving uh, um, machines, things that things that come with removing them from, from um, life-saving medical uh, techniques or devices that are not necessarily, they're not morally necessary. Um, so pair families have to make that decision. Well, praying the litany of the saints brings a great consolation because you remember you're part of the mystical family of, mm-hmm. of, of the church. And boy, howdy, it feels good to know that I've got all those people with me in the room mm. um, to comfort me. And so that's that's actually part of the ritual uh, for caring for the sick that the priests do. And as a family, it can be a great consolation because it's something, uh, whether you you got a four-year-old or you got a, a 70-year-old in the room, like we can all say, pray for us, mm-hmm. right? And it slows you down. And yeah. that's one of the things, Mickey, you kind of alluded to that's hard is in the midst of that those hours, sometimes days of sorrow, um, we can become very caught up in the sorrow mm-hmm. and we forget that we're supposed to die. Yeah, This is not yeah. the end. And while there's sorrow in the passing, there's the joy in the resurrection. There's mm. the joy in the new life of the soul uh, before the second coming that this, this person you've loved desperately is getting to live the life that, that we're all made for, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. And, 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 and so, yeah, the Lydia saints is one of those things. I'm just like, okay, everybody needs to remember. You can pray that you can find it on your phone. Um, but, in terms of the personal preparation, let's talk a little bit about that and we can get back to the communal preparation, but personal preparation, uh, don't wait. This makes my heart sad. A lot of times people are already comatose and they're mm-hmm. like, the family calls and says, can you come and anoint them? And, you know, I'm pretty sure they would have wanted to see the priest. Yeah. Mm-hmm. If that's the last yeah. thing they see, that gives them great consolation yeah. that they see their, their parish priest or whoever the chaplain is at the hospital. Mm-hmm. But to anoint them to be able to hear their confession mm-hmm. is a big thing. Um, we can give the apostolic pardon, and we do, um, presuming that this person desired, you know, to be free from all sin. Mm-hmm. But what a consolation that is at a, a at an objective level because it's sacramental, but also at the subjective level of that person's consolation in their soul of like knowing, okay, I've I've made myself right before God. Yeah. Um, so call the priest before you get to those last hours where the person may may not may not be able to speak or may be able to respond. And also you can give them viaticum, like you can give them communion for the journey to heaven. Mm-hmm. Um, and whew, I can't tell you how many times that's probably been at a kind of anecdotal level where I've seen the whole temperature of the room change. Mm, you wow. know? Like mm. even if it's a little fragment of a host that you yeah. can put on the, the tongue of the person who's dying, um, that person experiences something sacramental. Yeah. And we experience the saving grace of seeing Christ in action. Mm. Like 
wow, mm. he's really there. And it's not because of the priest. It's because he's really mm. there substantially in the Eucharist. So do those things for yourself. Tell your kids. Tell your whoever. Tell your husbands. If you know, your husbands are not going to outlive you. By the way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Well, I love your you husbands. You have to still but, be yeah, here if yeah. they don't. Some priest has to be. Yeah. No. But no. Pray God they will. They'll be there. But you know, your husband. Your husbands because they're just trying to keep up with y'all. Two like, fantastic <laughs> ladies. But uh, you know. We don't think about that. And then in the midst of it, we get sorrowful and we get sad and we forget these are all the things that are ordinary Mm -hmm. for the life of a Christian to receive all these sacraments, to receive anointing, to receive confession, to receive Holy Communion before Mm -hmm. they die. Um, And then the other thing that I would say personally is if you know that you are facing a terminal illness of some kind you've got stage four cancer you've got Mm -hmm. something you know tragic and sorrowful but you've got something that's realistic you need to not ignore that Mm. a lot of people Mm. i just spoke with a sweet woman and her husband the other day Uh, he came in he was worried about her because she's been diagnosed with a real significant form of aggressive cancer and she just lost hope Mm. you know there's that moment of this Mm. is the end like Yeah. yeah but it's not the end. Let's talk about that. Let's yeah. talk about the joy that you've lived 80-something years and yeah. had a good life and remember all the joy yeah. of that life. So it can the, the solve that, that, that we offer in the midst of sorrow is hope, right? Yeah. It's the hope of the resurrection. Yeah. And you need that. Your family needs that in the midst of those things. Mm-hmm. And so to not ignore death, uh, but to rather encounter death with the genuine Christian response is that what I'd sense. say. That's, that's how you prepare for a happy death. It sounds like the church really helps us to turn towards the eternal. That mm-hmm. in the And man, and as you were describing all of these different things, I'm just thinking, I am so grateful to be Catholic that we have all of these, all of these different things, but that the church actually gives us what we need. The fact that there's viaticum, literally food for the journey. Um, right. And that <laughs> suffering has meaning within our faith, that it's not just meaningless, but it's moving us towards something or moving us really towards a more like intimacy with our Lord um, mm-hmm. through that suffering. But yeah, that, that it all has meaning and it's pushing us towards that there is something more than just this final moment. Right, the sorrow of the bed. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, the sorrow of the bed's not the end. Yeah. And that's something that I found most fascinating sort of with my... Um, with my dad's death, because I always considered myself a very faithful, hopeful woman, mm. it was amazing to me how much like that death like shook, mm. and being overcome like with that earthly grief, like mm-hmm. the sorrow yeah. of the bed, was something that I don't know if I'm naive, but kind of took me by surprise. Yeah, um, of like, okay, well, now what do I do with this? You know, because for there were a time we didn't know if he was going to make it, if. Um, and so all of this sort of confusion, and if I could go back and sort of do things differently, I wish I could, um, in the sense of like learning how to navigate this sort of lane of grief, mm-hmm. but not let it overcome or overshadow the path of hope. Mm-hmm. And I was like, I wonder how many people have found themselves kind of in that. Like stuck. Yeah, stuck in this sort of area mm-hmm. and how to like remind ourselves that death is, I loved what you said, it's like, um, the joy that's in that because the person is finally fulfilling the purpose for which God mm. made them, yeah. right? Mm. Union with him, which mm. is beautiful. And it's almost as if to constantly remind myself and other others who are going through that grief, like, no, this is the purpose for which we were created. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a, something I've focused on a little bit more doing a lot of gravesides uh, is that that passage from Matthew chapter 25, uh, you know, from the foundation of the world, I have prepared a, a kingdom for you. Mm-hmm. And yeah, we are, I mean, 21st century Americans, we are right here, right now, all the time. We're yep. in our feels constantly. Yep. It's just the immediate yeah. feeling, whatever yeah. that feeling may be, that's where I'm at. Well, you're going to probably see past that feeling. And, and and you're going to probably had some different feelings before, right? So you, you, we all know that our feelings are going to come and go, but... It's not to say you can't feel the grief. That's and that's really the beauty of, of our faith is that it complements perfectly the natural disposition mm-hmm. of sorrow and grief that accompanies death with mm-hmm. the supernatural hope and joy mm. that can only come from Christ. Because as you said, Deanna, it means nothing without faith. 
I, I frequently preach about this at funerals of good faithful parents who have really faithless kids mm-hmm. who just showed up to mass. They, they honored their parents, praise God, and mm-hmm. had the funeral mass. But those kids live for, for their bellies, right? Mm-hmm. So I remind them in a genuine, genuinely charitable way, but sometimes kind of a little, little sting is like, this all means nothing if you're just here for show. Yep. Like mm-hmm. it, your parents, God willing, they're in heaven. You will not join them in heaven if this means nothing to you. Mm-hmm. Um, and so dealing with the sorrow, humanly speaking, is something that we do have to do. Mm-hmm. And counseling is sometimes necessary. Grief is real, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. It's very real. And sometimes you can get through it with good spiritual direction with your priest, but sometimes you have to go a little deeper and maybe see a, a therapist, and that's fine. Like there's nothing evil about that. But it has to meet the counterpoint of the victory of the cross. Yeah. Like, I mean, yeah. that's, that's it. That's Easter. That's what, that's what we celebrate. So it's bringing Easter into the context of even those moments in the corridors of the, of the hospital where it's, it's not easy to tell a family, because oftentimes this will happen, the, the, the hospital will call and say, Father, we're removing so-and-so from life support. The family would like to have a priest here. Well, what the hospital is really telling you is you need to be here because that person's going to die and we don't want to have to deal with the death. Mm-hmm. And that's fine. That's what yeah. chaplain mm-hmm. services are for. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you just come in as the chaplain and, and you know say a few prayers and walk away, you might have brought – you will bring some consolation again yeah. objectively mm-hmm. because grace works. Like if the sacraments are administered, mm-hmm. grace does its role. Uh, but – what a chance to give an evangelical sense of hope. Mm-hmm. Like, and you can minister to your family members who have fallen away from the church or whatever it may be. Like, in the midst of that, Catholics can be so much more of a light than we tend to be. We tend to cower away and not want to talk about faith and just get lost in the, the milieu of the emotions of the moment. It's like, no, no, wait. This, this supernatural hope that comes from Easter, mm-hmm. this is like the time to shine. Mm-hmm. Quite literally. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. so just encouraging people as you think about how to deal with death, how to deal with sorrow and tragedies of, of the dying, um, it's not to lose sight of the hope that comes from God. And on a little bit different note, and I know we got some other things we'll talk about, but just one of the things that I've seen beautifully flower in my parish, and it's, it's organically developed. I, I did a series on... Our Lady of Sorrows last year, mm-hmm. and I've had a devotion to her for a number of years, and there's now a group of about 35 men and women who are praying the sorrows, who have had tragedies, who have had mm-hmm. children who have died, who have had, mm-hmm. um, who have children who are drug addicts and, mm-hmm. you know, things like that, or they mm-hmm. themselves have been lost in the world. And, you know, to remember that in your grief <clears throat> and in the, the, the lack of consolation that you may be experiencing in prayer, there's no one in the world who's ever grieved as much as Our Lady. Mm, yeah. And yeah. boy, howdy, she can give you a <laughs> real sense of perspective, yeah. mm-hmm. which we sometimes need. Yeah. But also that sense of peace. Like, yeah, she saw the worst and was able to have hope mm-hmm. at the end. Mm-hmm. Like I, the seventh sorrow is, you know, they've wrapped Jesus up and she walks out of the tomb and she's just like, grief stricken to the depths of her being like my son is dead Mm -hmm. but she'd heard Jesus say that he'd rise so there's that little twinkle in her eyes like well we'll see what happens in a couple days (laughs) because she knew Mm -hmm. with with faith and hope that this was the truth and so we always have that great joy of we can go run to our mom and run to run to St. Joseph you know eat that Yosef like he is the patron of a happy death for a reason because he died in the arms of the of the best people that ever lived. Um, so, I know we got some other things to talk about, but I wanted yeah. so, seven sorrows, pretty clutch. Yeah, we have an episode on that. Yeah, we do. on that devotion. I'll make sure that ends up in the show notes. But yeah, and Father, you mentioned kind of like a communal aspect. And I don't know if that mm. kind of means like you know for those of us who are accompanying someone in that moment, you know, being able to be at mm-hmm. the bed, and it's not something that I've experienced, mm-hmm. um, but like I've heard my parents talk about, you know, being with their dads um, at the moment of their death and just some of the things that they've described. But I like, <sighs> it's we've been talking about kind of like this the the bedside of of sorrow or Mm -hmm. you know just being um it's so easy to fall into the sorrow of the moment but knowing like calling on the litany of saints like that's a powerhouse Mm -hmm. for sure 
what else do we need to keep in mind? Like if we have that privileged place and being able to think of it as a privileged place to mm-hmm. be with someone in their final moments, what should we do? Or and, and maybe it isn't doing, maybe it's just being, but yeah, what is as a Catholic? Yeah, the docility to be there is is a big part of it. This mm-hmm. is a, it's a weird kind of encounter, but in hospitals, a priest walks in and people kind of think, oh, somebody's dying. It's not always the case. Yeah. In fact, <laughs> very often it's not the case. I'm just going there because somebody had surgery and they wanted to be anointed or whatever. You know, I'm going to visit a mom who had a baby. Mm-hmm. Um, but so often I find non-Catholics ask me to come pray with them mm-hmm. and uh, and they because they want that consolation yeah. of prayer. And I think that's where Catholics need to be willing even in the midst of your mixed religion families or whatever to, yeah, pull out the rosary beads and hit mom up, ask her for all the, all the graces you can, um, to maybe bring a, uh, bring your Bible, bring it, bringing your Bible would be a huge thing just to share the story of the redemption with whoever. Cause you, again, you may have family members that are not close to God. Um, but the person who is dying, like they can hear very, that's like one of those scientific things we've seen is like, overwhelmingly, even if they're in a quote-unquote comatose stage, like they're hearing a lot of what's going on around them. And rather than just talking about non-important things like baseball scores or, you know, <laughs> which kid has to be where at what time, yeah. you can you can read the story of salvation. You can read the story of the infancy narratives. Um, mm. You can pray a you can you can pray a section of the Bible out loud and to kind of do a lexio with the person who's who's infirmed, um, but encouraging a sense of purposefulness when you're by their side. It's mm-hmm. not that you necessarily have to do, but you are mm-hmm. there for them. And yeah. so, not being distracted. Uh, I, one of the things that grieves my soul is that I'll go into a hospital room with adults um, who are by the bedside of their family member who's dying. And this is not always the case, but very often they're looking at their phone. Yeah. Mm. And I get it. Like there's nothing you can do. Yeah. I can't physically make you come back to life. God can do that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, It's distracting too. But it's just like, have some respect for the person you're in the room. Mm. Like that's it. And maybe you shouldn't be, you can't be there that long. That's okay. Like Mm -hmm. I don't like sitting in a hospital room for an hour with people uh, because I know that I'm going to at some point think about other things I'm supposed to be doing. So if I can go in and give them my full self for 20, 15, 20, 30 minutes, I'm going to do that yeah. rather than lingering on something that I know is not actually going to be beneficial to them because I'll be distracted. But family members need to be honest with themselves and say that. Like one of the, one of the things that's hard, like y'all know, I've talked about before when my nephew passed away, like he was in a, in a hospital for 48 hours before mm. he passed. Um, and that whole 48 hours, the exception of six in which I slept, I was awake and in the hospital with my family or at his bedside. Not for a minute did I think like, oh, I need to go somewhere else. And luckily the parish understood that this was a really intense situation. But it wasn't like I was just sitting there looking at Thomas, like, what are you doing, dude? You yeah. know, <laughs> I was praying. And then when I wasn't praying, I was reading to him or I would go talk to my sister and can, you know, try to console her and my brother-in-law or whatever. But, you know, it's just, I think we have a bad habit of a utilitarian mindset. Like if I'm not doing, then I'm not doing what I'm supposed to do. And it's like, no, you don't have to do something, be Be present. And there's some things you can do Mm -hmm. if you would like to, but you don't have to, but you can do some things to help console the dying and console each other. Mm-hmm. And Paul says that in Thessalonians, um, console each other with these words. Mm-hmm. And he goes on to talk about the resurrection. Mm-hmm. That's it. Yeah. And that's re- that's oftentimes the second reading at a lot of funerals. And it's like, yeah, these are the words of consolation. These are the only words that, that actually can console a human being mm. in the midst of mm. suffering and death is that you will have new life. Yeah. Right. It's what, cause what else can I say to you at that point? <laughs> Well, they're going to give you some more insulin or something. I don't. That's not going to console anybody. Right. So let's yeah. talk about the good news. Yeah, you know? yeah. Mm. that's so good. I think sometimes um, the fear can be that if they're like, "Oh, if I'm actually talking to them about the resurrection, then they really know that they're going to die." You know, mm. I do. I do think there's hesitancy yeah. on the part of of people to either call, first to call a priest, like 
but what if this isn't the end? Right. Um, or or um, yeah. talking about the resurrection, like, oh, what if this person thinks I've lost hope that they can come back from mm. whatever? Mm. And I think sometimes that those those very human like hesitancies can get in the way of like people, whether you're well or sick or on your we deathbed, all we all need to hear this yeah. message. So I'm so right. <laughs> You know, but I do think there is this hesitancy of like, oh, if I start mentioning this, what if the person lose their lose their hope to fight for this life? And do you do you see? I do, yeah. And and I will say this is a this is a cultural issue that's worldwide. Like Mm -hmm. we have gotten to the point where, you know, I won't I won't talk politics, but look at the pandemic. Look at how we react. Look at genuinely think about how the entire world. I don't want to blame anybody individually. It's just. We all acted like, oh my gosh, this is death end. never happens, but now it's here? No, we're all going to die. All what is it, like die. two million people die a day or mm. some absurd amount of... Mm. A lot of people die every day in mm. the world. Um, we just passed eight billion people in the world, by the way. But yeah, at, at, at some point, we're all going to face this reality. So uh, memento mori, mori is that kind of famous Latin phrase. Um, and it... it Remember, you will die. You mm-hmm. will die. It's not a matter of if, if. it's just a matter of when. <laughs> um, and in delaying the inevitable conversations that we need to have, we are filled with that kind of anxiety of like, yeah. oh, this is, I don't want to make them think that they're going to yeah. die. But it's like, no, it, you're, whether <laughs> you it's are. now or whether it's tomorrow, whether it's <laughs> six months point. from now. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about why we fear death. We fear death because we, we, fear, we fear death because we don't have a supernatural outlook. We don't think that there's another world to come. We don't mm-hmm. think that there's a new heavens and a new earth. We think mm-hmm. this is it. And don't get me wrong. I may sound callous, but this is not it. Right. Like, yeah. your dad was a good right. man. Yeah. I pray, God, you'll see him again in heaven. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right? And you do, too. Yeah. And I pray I'll see my nephew and my grandma and all these people that we know and we love and the babies that you've lost. Mm-hmm. Like, all of those things. But that's not fake. I really <laughs> do yeah. believe that. Yeah. And... I'm going to live out of that belief because that's what motivated the first mm. century martyrs like Ignatius of Antioch to say, yeah, let the lions chew me up because he believed in heaven yeah. mm-hmm. and he believed in a judgment too and, and hell, by the way, but he lived his life to go home. Yeah, yeah. Ugh, He man. lived his yeah. life to go back home yeah. and we need to live life to go back home. Mm. And I'm so glad you said that. And I think, too, this wasn't really part of our notes, and I wish we had more time. <laughs> um, but but the idea of um, of making sure that we, as parents, talk to this about our chil- mm. to our children. Mm. You know, I think this is one of the topics because we're like, what if it's traumatic? How are they going to deal with it? Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm sure we could have a whole other episode on how and when and what language to use to introduce your children to death. But I do think, I do think we've come to a place where we are so avoidant. Mm-hmm. of that or exposing our children to like extreme suffering um like where they see it um that we're just like well, i don't know if they should go and pray by the bedside of so and so because what if it's too much yeah. do you know what i mean instead yeah. of having those um, honest conversations about hey this isn't the end yeah we're we are their yeah. aid like this is our prayers are their aid mm. um so mm learning how to be at a place where we're not shielding our children from or ourselves from pain and suffering and grief. Yeah. The reality of of these things. Yeah. And I, as parents, you need to discern that with your spouses, of course, uh, to the best of your ability. But yeah, there, there is a, there's a real need for children to also see this because in a sense, we, as a culture, we, we, we ignore and avoid we have celebrations of life. Mm-hmm. And that's, I, I celebrate the life of people I love. It's mm-hmm. fun. Yeah. We, you know, with my grandma, with Thomas, you, with your dad, like yeah. it's, there is a joy to this person's mm-hmm. life that we want to commemorate, but there's, mm-hmm. there's also the fact that this person has passed away. Yeah. And what does that mean for a five-year-old? You may not want to take them into the critical care unit when grandma is on everything and the, like there's hoses yeah, coming right, out yeah. of her. But, Here's what they do before grandma passes away. They pull all that stuff out. Mm-hmm. She's usually going to be in hospice care, mm-hmm. and she might have one tube down her throat. Um, your kids can see that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And your kids probably need to see it, it more than you think because they need to know that this is where they may be with you, you know, 50 mm-hmm. years from now. Mm-hmm. And to see the care that you've put into caring for your dying parent or your grandparent will instill in them because, you know, better than I do, your mom's 
kids learn by actions more than words. Mm-hmm. So we, we do need <laughs> to teach, right? Yeah, we got to teach them. Yes, verbally, <laughs> but showing them. Um, and I know <clears throat> in the month of of November, even one of the things that we we do as a church is pray for all souls, mm-hmm. and we have the commemoration of all souls on November second. Um, so taking your kids to the cemetery to pray for people that you yeah. know mm-hmm. or people you don't know because mm-hmm. we got all those forgotten souls too um mm-hmm. but that can be a way in which you are gradually introducing them and reminding them that this is this is a pilgrimage mm-hmm. here mm-hmm. in preparation for a heavenly homeland amen Amen. I do want to ask one last question just sure. as we wrap up. But um, I know there are people who may be hearing this and like, okay, you know, this, these are the things that we do in preparation for, you know, if I'm able to be at the bedside. Mm-hmm. Um, but for someone who's like, you know, I wasn't able, either I wasn't able to be there or I'm not able to be there. Um, I know my parents have texted me sometimes like, hey, please pray for this person because yeah. they're probably going to pass in the next 24 hours or so. Um, but even just like words of consolation for those who like, maybe they weren't there at the moment. Um, but like the ongoing, what do we do beyond that moment? Mm -hmm. Like we, we've entrusted them into our Lord and we have a great hope that they're with our heavenly father. Um, but what are the things that we can do, um, moving beyond that moment? We have the funeral and then life continues. Mm -hmm. Uh, but how do we continue to maintain that prayerful spirit or, or yeah, whatever. There's no greater way to honor honor the dead than by praying for them yeah. and having mass said for them. Mm. So I know we say mass uh, every year for my nephew who passed away. Mm. Um, my nephew passed away with all the sacraments. I'm 99.9% sure he's in heaven. So, okay, he's like, I don't need those graces. Somebody else is going to get him. Cool. <laughs> all right. But... I can honor him and pray for him in that yes. way. Um, so having masses said for the dead is absolutely one of the things that Catholics especially need to be better about. Is like when somebody passes away, it's not morbid. It's not saying you're hopeless. It's saying, no, I'm hope-filled, and I know that prayer works. And the mm-hmm. most effective prayer in the world is the holy sacrifice of the Mass. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think one of the things that we should do better as Catholics that our Jewish forefathers did very well is uh, you sit in it with each other a little mm-hmm. more, right? Mm-hmm. Um, we have a tendency, especially now in the consumer fast paced culture we live in to, we go to the funeral, we go to the graveside and then we send them a text message a week later. And then maybe a month later we see each other again and it's like, Hey, how you doing since the thing? And then we kind of forget about it. And, and Hey, I'm not making, I don't want to try to make anybody feel bad. That's just, we are, it's reality. It's reality. So being more intentional about that follow through. Mm -hmm. Um, and when you've got, I got a text from my brother, two emails this morning to pray for people who are dying. Like, I'm going to follow up on those things tomorrow, and then I probably will forget about them. Hopefully not, but I probably will. So what do I do? I write myself a sticky note and say, hey, follow up in a week on this. Follow up and, you know. So giving yourself space to know you're not going to be perfect, but also saying I'm resolved to do this and doing it. Mm. Um, that It's just something that simple can make a huge impact like that – that phone call that I get every year from one of my friends about around the time my nephew passed away. It's deeply consoling for Mm me and they don't have to do that, but I'm like, wow, that's really, that's so sweet that I get that phone call or I get that text message. Um, and we can all do that for each other. We Mm -hmm. don't, it it doesn't require an act of Congress to send a sweet text message or, or to call or to drop off some food, just saying, Hey, I was thinking about you. And just thinking about your mom who passed away a couple of years ago we with Mickey with your dad. Like when I go to Louisiana now, I think about your dad. Like, <laughs> I'm like, all right, you're somewhere on the earth here, I think, uh, buried, <laughs> but you're in heaven, God willing. So pray for your daughter. Like I think about those things. Oh, just, that's so sweet. Yeah, well, you, <laughs> you're welcome. But it just, that sticks with me because I've seen people do that for me and I've seen people do that for other people and mm. it, it really is impactful. But yeah, I think that's the best way we need to be intentional about helping people through that grieving Mm -hmm. process um, and having masses said because there's nothing more efficacious. Yes. So I know we got to get done. You asked for a little antidote and I did want to share this before we go Um, because it was really impactful because I do go to the hospital a fair amount to see people and I'm with them in their dying moments. Um, A few weeks ago, a 78 year old man was his son who's in his early fifties uh, his son was in the hospital dying of stage four cancer and with in the room was the father of the now deceased the wife and their daughter um and 
I didn't know these people. They just moved here from, I think, West Virginia or somewhere. Anyhow, out of sight, out of mind. I came in there. I could tell. You can just kind of tell these people are not catechized. Like, okay, what can I do in this moment? The ritual of the of the burying the dead, or the, not burying the dead, but the ritual of anointing of the sick and prayers for, uh, for the dead or the dying. Um, I did all those things. And then I just kind of held the hand of the dad because mm. he's burying his kid. Mm-hmm. He knows that's coming. Mm-hmm. That's a terrible feeling. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's something that only Jesus Christ can bring healing to. So as a priest, that's so cool. And it's not me. It has mm-hmm. nothing to do with me. Mm-hmm. It has everything to do with the fact that in that moment, that dad who of, of the people in the room I think was the most faithful Catholic, like, knew his prayers man see a 70 something year old man just be consoled you could feel his whole body relax a little bit that's why you need to call your priest and yeah. have him come visit you man you just get at my heart i'm like just don't break down right now mickey um, but it's beautiful and i think this is i know we run over time but the beauty of our faith yes the yes. The tangibles that, you know, when someone is sick or dying, the church has prayers for that. Um, And to familiarize ourselves with that, to know that our priests love their flock Mm -hmm. and to not feel like we are a burden to them in our moments of grief and stress and uncertainty. But you want to father us through that. And I think that the faithful need to know that, like, Mm -hmm. that's that's your calling, your vocation. And our priests want to be there with us. So don't hesitate so that you can provide those consolation, those prayers. I think that's beautiful. Yes, yes. Thank you so much, Father. Yeah. This was, yeah. I'm just, the whole time, I'm just like, I'm so grateful to be Catholic. I'm just Amen. so grateful. Amen. Uh, well, Father, will you close us with prayer? I will. Let's pray in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And let us pray for all souls, uh, especially the forgotten souls in purgatory, that uh, they will see our Lord face to face this day through the intercession of our Blessed Mother as we pray. Hail Mary, full of grace, grace, the Lord is with thee. thee. Blessed Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Holy Mary, Mary, Mother of God, God, pray for us sinners sinners, now and at the hour of our death. death. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. St. Joseph, patron of a happy death, pray Pray for for us. us. Amen. Amen.